G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and today we're going to talk about the Emperor of Mankind. So, at my event that I held last weekend, I said, you know what, I really want to uh, have an event for the next year where everyone plays Primarchs. Now, Primarchs are inherently pretty unfun to play, but you know, if everyone has them, kind of evens it out a bit. And I don't want to have any double-ups of legions, so first in, first served. But for the Talons of the Emperor, I thought it'd be good to give them rules for the Emperor of Mankind. Because, well, he's the, the Lord of the Primarchs, so he should be an option. This is what I came up with. And I put the earliest versions of this uh, up for people to see on YouTube and on Facebook as a picture. Very interestingly... I got back the exact sort of feedback I thought I would get back from a few people, which made me chuckle, which was, those stats aren't good enough. Here's the thing. People naturally gravitate towards looking at the Primarchs and picking the top stats of each Primarch. So if a Primarch is Weapon Skill 9, then the Emperor should be a 9. If a Primarch is Initiative 9, he should be Initiative 9. No, the Emperor himself in the novels even states that there are Primarchs who outperform him in certain areas. He's not the strongest, he's not the toughest, he's just the best, most well-rounded of them. And so that was my starting point. Um, so before we get into the stat lines and things like that, up the top there I've stated, the Emperor is a Lord of War choice for both the Talons of the Emperor and the Legiones Astartes Loyalists. If selected, he may take a unit of Heterion Guard as a command squad as per the Legio Custode rules. So why can the Legions take him? Well, the Emperor led personally several Legions throughout the Great Crusade especially, and obviously when they get to Horus's flagship at the end of the Siege of Terror, he likely is going to be running around with a group of Astartes as well, as well as the Custodes and whoever else ends up on the ship with him. The Emperor's children got their moniker, the Emperor's children, after working alongside the Emperor and impressing him, uh, and they were his chosen legion of choice throughout the Great Crusade. The Emperor worked with a lot of legions, and there is the option here that legions could take him as a Lord of War, but at that many points, you're going to be needing to play a 5,000 point game in order to take him. So, on to the stat line. His stat line is completely lifted from... Lionel Johnson, because Lionel Johnson, it is said in multiple books, is basically the closest to the Emperor, uh, the least different to the Emperor, as it were, uh, on the genetic level. And to that, I added other Primarch's attributes, because the Emperor embodies many of these attributes. He has a lot of the typical special rules, except instead of the Primarch rule, he has the Emperor rule, and instead of the Sire of the Legion, he has Sire of Humanity. And other than that, he's very much what you see is what you get. His war gear includes the Auric Panoply, the Unifier, the Talon of Terror, Solaris, a Teleport Homer, and of course Frag Grenades, so he's not striking last in Assaults. The Master of Mankind Special Rule. As the Emperor is the originator of all humanity's armed forces, when leading the uh, Talents of the Emperor or Legion Force, he is treated as a Master of the Legion and must be taken as the Warlord and cannot choose a Warlord trait. The Sire of Humanity Special Rule The Emperor is a force of nature, more powerful than even his own sons can fathom. He is merciless in combat and his mere presence inspires all of humanity, be it in his guise as the Emperor or even as the Omniscia. Units the Emperor joins gains the Crusade and Furious Charge Special Rules. This is important if he joins a Legion as a Stardis squad, more so than a Legio Custode squad. In addition to this, all Loyalist forces on the tabletop use his leadership for all morale tests and can reroll pinning checks. Further, all models in the Loyalist army on the table gain plus two to all combat resolution due to his inspiring presence. This is actually very similar to a rule that Fulgrim has, where he gives a big buff to combat resolution. I believe it is plus two on Fulgrim as well. So I basically lifted it from Fulgrim, ported it over to the Emperor. Next we have his armor, the Auric Panoply. Now this is based off Rogel Dawn's armor, because Rogel Dawn's armor uh, is basically the same rules and is stated in the entry for it that it was made from the same material as the Emperor's armor, it was the leftovers. And so 
on the Emperor, it provides a 2 plus armor save and a 4 plus invulnerable save. And a lot of people are saying it should be a 3 plus invulnerable. I don't really see that. Um, 3 plus invulnerable saves in the Horus Heresy is generally only the most advanced Terminator armor among the Primarchs or Vulcan's customized Artificer made armor. Everyone else is. 4 up and 5 up invulnerable saves, with the exception of uh, Fulgrim and Jagadai, who in close combat can raise it up to a 3+. Plus. And really, with the Emperor's stat line and such, I don't see the need for him to have a 3+. Plus. It's just people getting their knickers in a twist, I think, and saying, well, the Emperor's the best, he should have the best of everything, but that's very boring to represent on the tabletop, and frankly, I don't think it gels well with the universe. There are plenty of better weapons, for example, the Emperor could use, he chooses not to. Uh, and I am choosing in this case to go a 4 plus invulnerable save. In addition, no attack may wound him on better than a 3 plus regardless of strength or special rule. Destroyer attacks instead cause d6 wounds at AP1, which he may attempt to save. And that's an important one, because you don't want your Emperor getting one shot. Uh, that last section, the destroyer attacks one, is the bit I added to Brogal Dawn's armor's rules. For the Emperor himself. Now for his weapons, I called his sword the Unifier. I don't know what the name of it is, it's just called the Emperor's Sword all the time. And essentially it's the 40k rules that Rabude Gilman had uh, in 7th edition. So strength plus 2, AP1, melee, armor bane, concussive, touch of the Emperor, whirling flame. A touch of the Emperor is 6s to wound in close combat with this weapon, it treated as D hits instead. And Whirling Flame. Instead of attacking as normal, the Emperor may make a single attack against all foes in base to base. So, cool. Um, now, the thing is, that's a really good weapon. So, you need to create another weapon for his Talon. So, he has like a big lightning core for his other hand. What do you do for that to make it worthwhile taking when you have a Strength 9 AP1 Armor Bane Concussive, potentially D weapon, hit everyone in base attack? You've got to build against it, so I chose the Talon of Terror. This gilded power core was gifted to the Emperor by the Adepts of Mars when he first claimed Overlordship of the Red Planet. Again, don't know if it has a name, but Talon of Horus, here we have the Talon of Terror. Uh, it is Strength plus 2, so the same as the sword. It's AP 1, same as the sword. But it's melee, shred, and has the slake special rule. Slake is, if attacking with this weapon, the Emperor gains plus 2 attacks, and for every 6 to hit rolled, gains an additional hit. So you're talking 7 attacks, 8 on the charge, and 6s to hit will generate extra hits. If you rolled perfectly uh, on a charge, you could be looking at 16 hits. So, potential reward, but it's a gamble, versus the Unifier, which is going to hit like a freight train. Then we have Solaris, a customized bolt gun, the prototype pattern which would later be copied for use by the Legionnaires, Astartes, and the Custodes. It's a bolt gun. It's range 24, but it's strength 6, it's AP 3, it's assault 4, and has the heliothermic detonation rule, which is thanks to the uh, friend Elliot pointed out it would be a good idea, and I agreed. Uh, the heliothermic detonation ties him in really well with the Legio Custodes, who have it as a, an option of war gear. Models wounded by it, not killed by the weapon, must take a toughness test. If they fail it, they cop a wound with instant death, in addition to the original wound, which is pretty nasty. Uh, the Golden Aura. So this is very similar to something like Magnus's Phantasmal Aura, for instance. Uh, because he's such a potent psyker and sort of phases in our reality, modifies his form as he so deems, it's a flat minus one to hit penalty against him uh, to a maximum of six plus, and any barrage weapons directed against him or units he has joined always scatter the full 2d6 inches. Last special rule is the big one, the Anathema of Chaos. The Emperor is the single most powerful Psyker in the known, uh, in known galactic history. His powers are seemingly without limit. I have a small typo in there, which I'll fix later. Uh, his closest rivals being Magnus and Melkador, both of whom fell short of his might. No demon can harm him when casting. His willpower and mental fortitude is simply too great. So, the Emperor is a mastery level 5 psyker. He knows all abilities within Sanctic Demonology. The Emperor is immune to perils of the warp. Further, when manifesting any Witchfire attack, he may attempt to channel more of his own power into the uh, power. By doubling the required warp charge for the attack, so warp charge 1 becomes warp charge 2 for instance, 
the attack instead gains unlimited range. So potentially powerful, but it is Sanctity because he's not the most powerful discipline, um, but definitely has some bonuses. Um, now I chose to go with Immune to Perils because Magnus already has the ability to be immune to perils for one turn or ignore one perils roll per turn. And uh, Magnus also gets to roll, uh, he may re-roll his results on the perils table. And so Magnus is a very, very reliable psychic. So to make the Emperor a better psychic than Magnus, you either have to give him more levels, which is, mm, I don't think, the best choice. So instead, I just made him a more reliable psyker. And as he's been doing it for so long, rather than going down the route of something like Biomancy and Warp Speed and all that crap, I went down the route of he would use something like Sanctic Demonology to represent the fact that he is anathema to chaos and fights against demons and his abilities are tailored to fighting against demons. Now, due to his role as the anathema of chaos, the Emperor gains hatred for all traitors and all traitors also gain hatred of the Emperor of Mankind due to their seething fury. Any monstrous creature with the demon rule instead gains preferred enemy against the Emperor of Mankind to represent how Dracod Nien will be the end of the Emperor. If the Emperor is slain, the opposing player immediately gains plus three victory points on top of any other relevant scenario rules. So don't let him die. So there you go, that's how I came to the conclusions. He got his stat line based on the Lion's stat line. Not because you, again, this is where people, they get it wrong. They go, oh, the, it's the Emperor, he's the best, the strongest. He's not the best and strongest. He can be hurt, he is mortal. Horus did take him down. It was a supercharged Horus, but he did take him down. And that supercharged Horus was wounded and nearly taken down by uh Lehman Russ. So we know if Lehman Russ can take down Horus, Lehman Russ has a good chance of being able to take down the Emperor in there. Uh, may not be a great chance, but it is a chance. And that means the Emperor has to be within striking reach of many of these Primarchs. We also know the Emperor was bested in feats of strength by Vulcan, uh, and in some feats of strength by Russ when he was testing the Primarchs to find out more about them. So we know that they exceed his stat lines in some capacity, and he's very hard to represent on the tabletop. So the choices I made bore that in mind. Special rules. Again, I didn't want to load up on special rules, having custom transport flyers that he can take and things like that. He's got enough going on here. It's busy enough for my taste as it is. So whilst this isn't isn't the be-all, end-all, uh, as it were, for rules for someone like the Emperor. You could definitely give him more. Uh, he's incredibly strong. And I think I've given it a fair crack. So I would love if people could actually go out and try them out and then give me some feedback. Was it overpowered, underpowered? I would like to know. I've got the feeling that he will kill pretty much any Primarch consistently in close combat. Horus and his Disabling Strike could be a problem, but again, if the Emperor is using his Sanctic powers wisely uh, and gets in just a couple of good hits with the Unifier, uh, which would be the weapon of choice, obviously, for fighting another Primarch, he could probably just de-hit Horus straight off the table. Uh, even if it doesn't go off, you're talking a Primarch who's going to be striking Strength 9, Strength 10 if he's got Hammerhand cast. He's going to be fighting with more attacks than most of his enemies. He's going to be very solid, very hard to take down. And six wounds doesn't sound like a lot, people might say, but six wounds is what someone like Vulcan has. And we, Vulcans are perpetual. Vulcan can come back from the dead in the stories, but it doesn't translate on the tabletop. Same thing with the Emperor. You can't just listen to those outlier stories where something happens like, I don't know, his head gets ripped off and he just grows a new head. If something like that happens in one story, I don't know that I put as much credence on it as I would in other stories. And as for force weapon attacks, it was something I really toyed up, but well, the Unifier already allows him to have the ability to, on all sixes to wound, becomes D-hits. Like, how strong a weapon can you conceivably have? He's going to be striking at strength 9 or 10 regardless, which is going to instant kill anything less than a toughness 6 monstrous creature. So, you know, let's keep it in the realms of reality where it's actually something you could play on the tabletop. 
Anyway, I want to know your thoughts. Give me your feedback below. Mac with the Hour Circle. Thank you all for watching this different episode. This is a chance for you guys to critique my rules now that I've explained how I came up with them. And I'll see you all on the next one.